Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing the Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. This podcast is intended for medical professionals. The information is to be used in the context of your own clinical judgment, and those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice, and even though the magic of podcasting may make it seem like we're speaking directly in your ears, this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Ryan Diab is an ophthalmologist in the Chicago suburbs of Northwest Indiana. She went to med school at the University of Illinois at Chicago and did her residency at Case Western Reserve. We discuss what she thinks all physicians should know about ophthalmology, which starts with how to spell it. We discuss the management of acute eye injuries and why every pink eye doesn't get treated with antibiotic drops. She also really deflates my balloon when she dispels the myth that an avulsed eyeball should be kept in milk until it can be reattached. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have ophthalmologist Rand Diab, and she's here to share with us everything every physician should know about ophthalmology. So Dr. Diab, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. So we, we're going to start things off with a riddle, a riddle that should have a pretty apparent answer. And we talked about it uh, beforehand to make sure I asked, asked it properly. But what has seven fellowships and weighs an ounce? <laughs> I think I know what it is. An eyeball. An eyeball. So an eyeball, something that small. For those on the metric system, if you're not sure how big an ounce is, just think about how big an eyeball is. And, and that'll give you an idea about how, how heavy an ounce is. So. There are seven different fellowships for that tiny, tiny part of the body. And if you have that many fellowships, it must be pretty complicated. So Dr. Diab is here to talk to us about, try to demystify some of uh, what's, what's out there about the eyeball. So if you had a med student rotating with you and you didn't know what field they were going into, what are the types of things that you'd want them to take away from a rotation? So the first thing I would want them to know is the name of our specialty and how it is spelled. A lot of people <laughs> struggle with ophthalmology because we say ophthalmology, but it's written ophthalmology. So spelling, it seems to be challenging for a lot of people. So that would be, I think, a good place to start. When I was a medical student, you know, this was, I guess the, the internet had been around for a while, but, you know, not, not that long. And um, or email, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. So someone had inadvertently emailed the entire listserv, meaning to just email the dean saying that they were interested in ophthalmology, and of course he misspelled it, and so the uh, the dean replied back, also reply all, sweetheart, you'd first better remember, uh, you'd first better learn how to spell it properly. It was a little embarrassing. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, so that would be the first thing. I think it's important and we appreciate it. And the other thing that's related kind of to that is knowing the difference between our field and optometry. And for a lot of lay people, that's very confusing because a lot of people just say eye doctor. And mostly when they say that, they mean the optometrist, but it kind of all gets mixed up together. So if I had a medical student, someone who's, you know, in, in medical school and going to be a physician... I think it would be important for them to know that an ophthalmologist is a fellow physician and an optometrist has a different course of training. So I found that even sometimes my fellow physicians don't really know uh, when they should see an optometrist versus an ophthalmologist. So that would be an important thing to learn. And um, one of the, the critical differences is obviously in our training as an ophthalmologist, we go to medical school for four years and then we do four years of ophthalmology residency. And as you pointed out, we have then seven different fellowship tabs we can choose or we can stay in comprehensive ophthalmology, which is what I did. Um, so uh, whereas an optometrist would go to undergrad and then they would go to four years of optometry school and our training is very different because we get uh, the whole medical training that all other physicians get in medical school, as well as the surgical training of the eye. 
and we are able to consider the patient's medical, their entire medical history uh, into what we're looking at, which is, is really oftentimes plays importantly into what we're doing. And, um, and optometrists tend in most cases to be more focused on prescribing glasses and contact lenses. So anytime somebody has a more medically related problem with the eye, I would recommend seeing an ophthalmologist for that. And, and I think there's a little bit of scope of practice uh, conflict there because I'm, I'm sure that they're, they have their lobbyists pushing at the state level to increase their scope of practice to overlap more with ophthalmologists and their argument inevitably is going to be access to care. Um, so this is just another example of why we should be all involved in advocacy. Am I, am I correct here? Absolutely correct. There are many states where they have gotten um, made progress in, in changing scope of practice laws, and um, they have a very active uh, political lobby. It's in many ways maybe more active than ours, and um, and it is it's actually a very important issue for us that we face as ophthalmologists and as physicians in general because we're facing these scope of practice issues on so many fronts. Um, but definitely, when it comes to surgical things. Uh, we would really like the surgical conditions to be managed by those who are trained surgically. One of my earliest episodes was all about high return on investment, low effort advocacy. So if this is something that affects you, make sure you check out that episode. Okay, I'll stop plugging my own podcast. Um, but uh, so how to pronounce it, how to spell it, and what makes you different from an optometrist? But what are what are some of the conditions that you want us to look out for, and maybe even start a workup, um, or uh, maybe patients that you should be referred that aren't being referred? You know, we uh, a couple episodes ago we had Doctor Afib talking about Afib, and his one of his major points was that in order to decrease the risk of recurrence, you really need early referrals. So the sooner you can send to the electrophysiologist, the better. So let's maybe talk about that. What what are some things that you think should be sent sooner to the ophthalmologist? So the most common things that, that other physicians send us are things like diabetics or diabetic checks. Uh, there are some standards of care in terms of when we should check them after being diabetic for so many years and how often we check them. And then certain medications such as Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, a lot of um, patients who uh, have autoimmune diseases are on that. So they uh, require certain types of monitoring as do other medications. So those are pretty routine. And I think think most of the people who are prescribing those medications or dealing with those kinds of patients are familiar with uh, how often they should be examined. Um, there may be some things uh, that are a little bit less obvious, like um, there are, for example, I'll give an example, giant cell arteritis. That's a tough condition sometimes to diagnose until you get a temporal artery biopsy. Uh, but there, uh, there are definitely some um, important ocular manifestations of that, and that can lead to blindness. And so I think uh, knowing how to really evaluate that and work it up and working the ophthalmologist into that uh, can be an important, uh, an important part of that patient's care. Uh, there are a lot of vascular conditions uh, that can benefit from ophthalmology evaluation uh, earlier on. So sometimes we may... Uh, any patient who has, for example, uh, transient visual obscurations where they're sometimes losing vision, uh, those, those kind of patients would require our evaluation earlier on. I generally find in my practice that most of my colleagues are really good about referring patients who have any question about the eye. And I think we kind of get to the other side of the issue, which is that it seems like people don't really want to deal with the eye. So they would actually much rather, any question about the eye, they would much rather refer it. Uh, you know, so sometimes I think we, we feel like it would be useful if, if there was a little bit better triaging of what needs to be seen more urgently for us versus what maybe uh, could, could take some time and we don't have to see it right away. Give us an example. So... Um, the, the, the really kind of urgent things would be sudden, somebody has sudden onset, let's say, uh, light flashes and floaters, uh, or maybe they have some peripheral vision loss. Uh, those kinds of things could be uh, indicative of a retinal detachment or a retinal tear, and we would want to see that right away because we could get that under control before it needs surgery. Um, something like anything that involves loss of vision, even if it's temporary. Um, some of the things I think that kind of tend to get managed uh, 
outside of our office are like red eye type conditions. Um, and sometimes those are hard to know what we should see and what we shouldn't see. I would generally say if you've seen a patient for something that involves red eye or pain in their eye and you've given your first line, which I've noticed in most cases, an antibiotic eye drop uh, that the people tend to give, uh, and they're not improving within a few days, then you should probably have them evaluated by an ophthalmologist. Because we'll get a lot of patients who have gone back and forth three times. You know, they've been in urgent care, they've been in primary care, they've been at maybe even in an emergency room. So they're getting different people giving them different things, and they're not, they're obviously not getting better. And those people would have done better if they had seen us early, because sometimes they may have something like a herpes complex keratitis, and that has its own course of treatment. And most patients don't, most adults don't have bacterial conjunctivitis. So treating with antibiotic drops has a really limited benefit in most of these cases. So, so how would you treat it then? Like if you, if you just say, so I would imagine that the pain there's, there's likely, I mean, obviously it's red, um, maybe accompanied with some pain, but no discharge. Is that correct? That's one of the common presentations. Yeah. So a lot of those patients who just have like a red eye that's kind of painful, um, they don't, they actually, they don't have a bacterial infection. Sometimes it could be viral, but that usually has a little bit different presentation. Um, but a lot of those are actually maybe dry eye or some type of, um, their eye is just inflamed or irritated sort of for some unknown cause. It's not infectious. Uh, a lot of those times we actually treat them with lubricating drops, um, you know, which is so simple, but, um, but we wouldn't know that if we didn't do a full exam and make sure that there's not something else going on. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's allergy and sometimes there's inflammation of some sort. But generally, um, if there's no discharge and there's, you know, there's no injury, um, then, uh, you know, and if, especially if they've already been on a course of antibiotic drops and they're not getting better, then they definitely should see somebody. So if it's an adult, then you would say if the, if the physician isn't sure and they want to try something before they send, it, you would say rather than antibiotics, start with a lubricating drop. And if there's no significant improvement, then send them on. That's a good thought. If there's no discharge, you know, the eye is mildly red, they're irritated, there's no significant visual loss, that's an important thing. And it, it's really helpful if, if you can look at the eye. Um, and I think that goes back to maybe that one of the main things I would want a medical student to learn on a rotation with me, and, and I do have sometimes medical students, and I spend a, a lot of time making sure they know this, is just the basic anatomy of the eye. It, it seems simple and it's a small structure, but it makes a big difference if people can kind of imagine uh, what they're looking at, you know, they kind of have a sense of what the anatomy is. Um, and that's really important. So I think getting, being able to look at the eye, even just with a pen light, uh, it doesn't have to be a fundoscopic exam because most of these things like red eyes and stuff, they're, they're not necessarily uh, something that's going to affect the fundus. Uh, so just making sure there's no obvious opacity on the cornea. Let's say there could be a corneal ulcer. That would be pretty serious. Um, if it's something as simple as just a subconjunctival hemorrhage, then that usually doesn't, you know, they look really dramatic and they look really scary. And I get so many of those sent to my office urgently and they're never anything to worry about. So, um, you know, so looking at the eye can make a big difference in, in terms of what you decide to do with the patient. So you think because we learned the fundoscopic exam in medical school and it's, it can be challenging, and then if we can't do it, then we're just going to write off the eyeball together and say, eh, I don't know what to do with that. Send them to ophthalmology. It, it, it might be the case, yeah, <laughs> in some cases. And I, you know, uh, yeah, and the other thing is that um, the things that we consider important when we're, when someone's referring a patient to us would be, would be to know what their vision is, for example. So that's, you know, kind of like the vital signs of ophthalmology, vision, eye pressure, pupils, at least vision is useful to us. Like, is there, is there a change in their vision? What is their vision? Has it dropped? Because that will definitely change the urgency of the situation uh, if there's been a drop in vision. And, and also when, when checking a patient's vision, um, make sure that they have whatever their corrective lenses or contacts or glasses or reading glasses or whatever, that they're using them. You know, so if they, were, if they just wear reading glasses, then they can put them on and maybe look at something, read something up close, but they have to do each eye separately. So, or you won't find the problem. Um, but if they don't wear glasses or they wear glasses for distance, you know, you might not have an eye chart in your office. So just having them read something, cover one eye compared to the other eye can be useful. Uh, so just to get, you know, some idea of where they're at with that, that's important. Okay. So a change in vision is, is going to change our acuity. So look at the eye with a pen light, identify all the structures you can, try a fundoscopic exam if it's something you're comfortable with, and then check the vision. And if there's a change in the vision, then it's going to lead to a more acute uh, referral to ophthalmology. Definitely. 
So are there any other conditions that you want to review uh, that maybe we, you know, that that uh, most physicians should be familiar with? Um, here's, here's an important thing that I don't want to miss. If a patient has had surgery on the eye, especially if it's a glaucoma surgery, um, but if it's even if it's a cataract surgery and it was, let's say, recent, and they have redness or change in their vision, then in that case, we would worry about endophthalmitis, which is an infection inside the eye, and that can be very serious and devastate the eye if it's not caught early. So in terms of really serious things, asking about a surgical history, um, that would be important as well. Uh, and asking, pay, and another thing that I think gets very confusing uh, for, for other doctors is, when do you have to worry about medication use and glaucoma? Because a lot of medications say they're contraindicated in a patient with glaucoma. Most of those are for people with narrow angle glaucoma, which is really the, the minority of what we treat. We usually are treating people for open angle glaucoma. So um, the patient might not even know that they have open angle glaucoma. So it may be a little bit confusing, but generally most medications that are labeled contraindicated for glaucoma are for narrow angle. Uh, so that's an and isn't, isn't that treated surgically? Yeah, narrow angle glaucoma we treat by uh, doing a laser treatment on the eye. So hopefully, if they do have it, they won't have it for long, and then you can treat them with whatever you were planning to treat them with. Right, and so it's, it's usually not super relevant in terms of you know the, the medications. It's good to ask, but in, in terms of open angle glaucoma, what is relevant is that steroid medications elevate the eye pressure, and so that can worsen someone's glaucoma or even cause glaucoma uh, in somebody who doesn't have it or uh, causes cataracts as well. So anybody who is on steroids. Like, for example, especially if they're on a prolonged course, but even a short course, uh, federal dose tag, um, patients who are on uh, inhalers, patients who are on uh, steroid face cream, uh, things like that, they definitely have an increased risk of elevated eye pressure, which can lead to glaucoma, and also they have an increased risk of cataracts. So those patients, if they're going to be on those medications for any extended period of time, especially long-term, should get evaluated. And I've had on... Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of patients over the years, younger patients who've had cataracts and can only recall being on steroids one time, like one medrol dose pack or, you know, something like that. So it can definitely have a significant effect. So if someone has, say, mild persistent asthma and needs to remain on an inhaler indefinitely, these patients should be seen by an ophthalmologist at a, a regular rate? They should at least get one evaluation and then let the ophthalmologist decide how often they would want to see them. Uh, I think that would be beneficial for them. Interesting. Yeah, as an ENT, we use a lot of steroids either for sinus infections or polyps or actually a multitude of of things. We see a lot of pain syndromes for the TMJ. Sometimes those get treated with uh, with steroids. So so that's definitely good for for me to be aware of. Although sometimes I do have a, a disagreement with the ophthalmologist on call when there's a sinusitis that leads to an orbital cellulitis. And, you know, sinusitis is treated very effectively a lot of the time with steroids. So I want to treat the underlying problem and they want to protect the eye. And we're both ultimately trying to protect the eye and treat the patient appropriately. But, it, you know, mm -hmm. we frequently butt, butt heads about whether or not this treatment with steroids is, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep the patient out of the operating room. And uh, sometimes the steroids are the way to do that. So that can lead to a little yeah. bit of uh, conflict. I can see that. So. Um, what about eye injuries? So, you know, this is part of what this podcast is all about is that we, we're physicians and we're also community members. So we might be a situation where we're like an orthopedic surgeon. We haven't seen an eyeball since our, uh, ophthalmology rotation as a third year medical student, but you know, we have, we're in a softball game and someone gets an eye injury and they say, Hey, doc. Can you take a look at this? And, you know, we haven't seen eyeballs except when we're talking to people and looking at them in the eye. So how do we, differ in that situation, how do we differentiate an acute injury that requires immediate referral to the ER versus something subacute that can wait for an outpatient appointment with an ophthalmologist? So obviously the type of injury, so if it was like a missile injury, something like a ball hit the eye really fast, it seems like the impact, those kinds of things should be taken into consideration. Generally, what I've found is that there's usually one area that takes the brunt of the impact. So if, it's, if, they're really, if the injury hits around the orbit, for example, you know, you see bruising around the orbit, tenderness, you may have an orbital fracture, but in most of those cases, the eye 
is somewhat protected because the orbit took the majority of the impact or the brow. And that's ideal, you know, or the nose, because then you protect the eye. And that's why the orbit tends to protrude a little bit around the eye. It protects it. Um, so if, if that's not the case and the eye takes the brunt of the injury, then they definitely should get an evaluation because there could be internal trauma to the eye that might not be evident externally. Um, but again, we'll go back to the basic things, the vision. Uh, sometimes in an acute injury, they may get really blurred initially, you know, just from the initial shock and trauma, and then it may clear up. So just knowing how is the vision doing. And if there is a significant vision loss, even if it's just for the first minute, I would I would worry about, you know, that eye. So it's obviously had enough of an impact to, to do that. Um, looking at the eye, again, even just get your uh, camera, um, your um, cell phone light out and, uh, and just look at the eye just to kind of see just does the pupil look round? Because in a really bad injury, uh, you can actually get uh, a, a ruptured globe anterior, like you get a laceration of, let's say, the cornea, and then the usually the iris tissue will just jump to fill that gap, so then the pupil will be distorted. That's a definite emergency. Um, so then another thing you might be able to appreciate is if you can't see the iris, then there might be a hyphema, which is that there's actually blood in the anterior chamber. Um, but most injuries are probably going to have uh, some level of subconjunctival hemorrhage. So the, the conjunctiva uh, is going to be more red um, under the conjunctiva or, you know, between the conj and the sclera. Um, and then uh, corneal abrasions are really common as well. So corneal abrasions will usually present in like a scratch type of injury. Um, and the eye will be very painful. It'll be really hard to open the eye. It tears a lot. People just want to keep it closed. Uh, so those are usually corneal abrasions, and those should be seen relatively soon as well because we don't know how uh, deep the injury might be, how large, and also what the risk of infection is. A lot of them are fingernails, and fingernails tend to carry a lot of bacteria, so we would want to treat those. Um, so just kind of assessing the situation, and, and especially if you saw the injury happen, that might help you to know uh, the potential for, for how bad it could be. And let's say the eye comes out altogether. Do you, do you treat it like a tooth and like put it in a cup of milk until you can get to the, to the emergency department? That's actually a really good thing to know, the tooth and the milk uh, thing. That helped my, my son when he was six months old. We saved his tooth and replanted it like an hour later. It was crazy. But you can't do that um, with the eyeball. <laughs> so the eyeball doesn't come out. So a lot of people ask us that. A lot of patients <laughs> think when we do cataract surgery that we actually remove their eye. Um, the eyeball is very well attached to the rest of the body. You um, wash it off it, in one of those golf ball <laughs> containers before you put it back in. Before we plop it back in, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it can be prolapsed a little bit outside of the eyelids, you know, if it's if there's like some proptosis or something. And that can be pretty scary. Uh, but it can't come all the way out. I mean, if it came all the way out, it's actually able to can really horrible injuries, but then it would, there's nothing we could do. So I was trying to make like, a joke and, and that, that <laughs> I killed it. A little bit. You did. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay. So there, are there any other injuries that we might encounter or any other things to look for? So you, you mentioned change in the iris, uh, obscured pupil, change in vision, uh, possible corneal abrasion. Um, and I would imagine if you think the globe is ruptured, that would probably be a reason to to immediately send the patient to the ER. Yeah, so a lot of globe rupture happens in the posterior part of the globe, so you can't see it. We can't even see it on our exam. Um, there are some, you know, some, sometimes on imaging, like on CT scan, they might be able to detect it if it's changed the shape of the globe. Um, but as I mentioned before, anterior globe rupture could happen along, uh, maybe along the cornea for if there was a puncture wound or something like that. And then you would you really should be able to tell if like there's iris coming to the wound. Um, that's critical or we would need to immediately deal with that um, because obviously that tracks infection into the eye and that tissue necrosis. And those are really serious. Um, the other thing is foreign body. So we get a lot of foreign body injuries. They're usually small uh, rust colored metallic objects that get um, kind of stuck into the cornea and those need to be removed. Those can be of various varying depths. So some of them are very superficial. We can just kind of remove them with a small forceps or a needle. And some of them can be pretty deep and, and need a lot of work to get removed. Um, so that's another important thing you, you'd be able to see. I had one recently um, that was pretty large and um, it was a dark colored foreign body and the way it was sitting on the eye. Um, 
whoever evaluated the patient in the ER told me he had a hole in his eye. So they, they thought that that dark spot was like a hole, not that it was, didn't realize it was a foreign body, I guess. And so, um, and he saw me like a couple of days later and I thought, wow, if it was a hole in the eye, like we would want to see that immediately within an hour. <laughs> So I was glad Does that, that happen? happened. Well, I guess that's a ruptured globe. That's a ruptured globe. I mean, yeah, what's a, a hole, hole in the eye, right? It's like yeah. <laughs> very serious. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, the there people have varying. Um, that was an NP, by the way. That was not not a physician, but people have varying levels of uh, assessment that they're able to do on the eyes. Hence the reason for this podcast, and and you're educating us. <laughs> right. I hope it's useful. So far, very much so. So um, before we start wrapping up, um, are there any other issues that, say, a rotating med student, uh, a rotating NP, anyone you know who's going to be seeing your patients before sending them to you that you'd like them to know? Yeah, two things that I haven't mentioned. One, there was a study published somewhere in an emergency medicine journal that said um, that when you have a patient with a corneal abrasion, as I mentioned before, they're extremely painful, that you could give them uh, ocular anesthetic drops to take home, like prescribe them or send them home with some just to reduce the discomfort um, and help them until they see the ophthalmologist, presumably. Um, we are very opposed to that. I, I don't, that, that study, there's a lot of holes in that study and I don't have it in front of me to go through it, but um, in, in ophthalmology, we're very, very opposed to anybody going home on ocular anesthetics. And the reason for that is that it inhibits epithelial healing and it can cause something called a corneal melt, where basically the cornea just kind of melts, and it's it's and you can't just fix that. You have to eventually, once it you heal it and stuff, you have to transplant it. So um, the, because that that is such a serious condition, um, the, we we take that very seriously. So we're we're very careful on a couple things that we wouldn't want someone giving our patients without really having a good exam. Ocular anesthetics never send them home with anesthetic eye drops because they may just keep using them and not come to us until they have a corneal melt. And we've seen that. And then the second thing is we really don't prefer for patients to be sent on steroid drops because of the risk of it being, as I mentioned before, a herpes simplex condition or something herpetic, even zoster, uh, of the cornea, which would get much worse with steroids. Um, and, and those are sometimes, they can masquerade as other things. So sometimes even for us, they're hard to diagnose. And I wouldn't expect um, someone without a slit lamp and without our training to be able to diagnose that. So those would be two things to watch out for. And then I'll add one last thing. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the things is important to get familiar with the pupil, looking at the patient's pupil. So if they're, because there are some critical conditions like um, a third nerve palsy that involves the pupil that are emergencies. So if you, you know, just again, I kind of a feel for what the normal pupil looks like, how it reacts, compare one pupil to the other. If their pupil is large and non-reactive and they have ptosis or something, or they have a limited extraocular motility or they're complaining of diplopia, you know, then that could be um, a pupil involving third nerve palsy, which would be an emergency. So um, that would be another uh, thing to get familiar with looking at at the eye. It's interesting. There used to be these eardrops on the market, oral GAN, that were anesthetic eardrops, and they're off the market now. And I'm not sure the reason, um, but I know an otolaryngologist would never prescribe numbing eardrops because, you know, if it's an otitis externa, you're going to treat the otitis externa. If it's some referred pain, then you're going to treat the referred pain, right? You're, you're always going to treat the underlying problem. You're not going to just give an anesthetic. I mean, there, there was, I, I, I had never prescribed it. And then I read somewhere that it was, was off the market. So I think it's a similar, you know, it's, we always want to keep our patients comfortable, but not in lieu of, uh, you know, their ultimate outcome. Right. And corneal abrasions are really miserable, but generally they're kind of like when you bite your tongue, it's really painful at first, but 24 hours later, it's much better. So um, you wouldn't want to have something that could have healed in 24 hours to become a potential ocular disaster. Yeah. Is there anything that you learned in med school that you found out later either was overturned by, by research or you found out was actually misinformation to begin with? I'll, I'll give you an example. Because in, in medical school, one of the things I learned was that postnasal drip is one of the most common causes of cough. Now, postnasal drip is a symptom, not a diagnosis. So it kind of misses that the diagnosis that's causing cough is either a cold or a sinus infection, which I think you can hear in my voice that I have one of those right now. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that was, that was 
kind of a misunderstanding of of the physiology. Is there anything like that that happened to you that when you did your your residency, you found out, huh, you know, maybe maybe that's a, a little bit of misinformation. I actually can't think of anything, but you know, it's been a long time. I, it was about, um, I finished my residency about 16 years ago. So I, I can't think of those uh, examples. <laughs> well, good. That's a good thing. You were, uh, yeah. well I went educated. to a great med school. <laughs> All right. Well, is there anything else you, again, we've covered a lot. Is there anything else that you, you, uh, you want to mention before we wrap this up? Um, no, I think we got through all the, the big things. I think so too. So, uh, you know, are, where, where can people find you online? I have a website, randiab.com. It's my first name, last name.com. And I blog there and I also post educational videos about ophthalmology uh, that are kind of geared towards my patients in some ways and just the general public. Other physicians could benefit them as benefit from them as well. Um, and I'm on YouTube uh, under my name as well, Randy Ab MD. Uh, but all of my YouTube videos are also on my website, so that's probably the best place to start. Fantastic! A lot of very useful information that would benefit physicians and the general public. Well, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was very good. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. We can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. Our show is produced by Guilfrey Studios in New York City. You can find them at guilfreystudios.com. Our theme music was written by our show's producer, voice actor, Karin Guilfrey.